This book is called The Efficient, Inventive, Often Annoying Melville Dewey. It's written by Alexis O'Neill and illustrated by Edwin Fotheringham. My heart is open to anything that's either decimal or about libraries. Melville Dewey. Melville Dewey loves putting things in order. Oh no, what's he doing now? He's organizing the chaos of his mother's kitchen cupboard. And now the cellar. There, nice and neat. Melville loves keeping track of things. He's recording his height, his weight, how much money he has earned. Melville loves books. He tucks his money into his pocket and goes for a 10-mile walk. Wait, where's he going? Melville treks 10 miles from his home in Adams Center, New York, to Watertown. He buys an unabridged Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, the biggest, thickest book in the shop. And inside that book, words in tidy lists, words in alphabetical order, easy to find delicious words. Then he rushes back home. After locking his father's shop at night, Melville sometimes stretches out on the leather hides in the storeroom. He wonders, what will I do with my life? He wants to leave the world better than he found it, but he doesn't know quite how. Not yet. In the meantime, Melville attends Hungerford Collegiate Institute in Adams, New York. Something terrible happens on a freezing cold night in 1868. Fire! Melville to the rescue. He saves books, armloads of books, but inhaling smoke and icy air causes him to suffer racking coughs. The doctor predicts he won't live a year, but he does. Now he obsesses about how to use his days on earth efficiently. He wants to make the biggest difference in the world in the least amount of time. Melville notices that lots of new immigrants are flooding into America. Many of them can't read English yet. They need an education. Fast, fast, fast. Hold on. That's it. He will help people get their hands on good books. After all, reading is a mighty engine, beside which steam and electricity sink into significance, he writes. Books will give them a good education, efficiently. That will make a big difference in the world. But first, Melville needs to get an education himself. At Amherst College, he studies. He's at the college library all the time. He even gets a job there, but hardly anyone ever uses it. Melville can't blame them. How inefficient! Amherst's 30,000 books are arranged by shelf number, not subject. When there are too many books for a shelf, the whole collection has to be rearranged. Look at all the time it takes to find the book you want. Before long, Melville takes care of that problem. Ah, how he loves books in libraries. But usually, only rich people in expensive schools have them. How can you read if you don't have money to buy books or pay for college? Melville has a brainstorm. Why not provide the best reading for the largest number of people at the least cost? Why not promote free public libraries for everyone? People can borrow books instead of buying them or paying to subscribe to a service. That is not a new idea but no one is as noisy and persistent as Melville about pushing for it for everyone. But do you know what a big problem is? No two libraries shelve books the same way. Some do it by the author's last name. Some do it by the size of the book. Some do it by the color of the cover. Some even stack books from floor to ceiling. What a hodgepodge! 
Night and day, Melville dreams about ways to organize libraries. He dreams about numbers and decimals. He's in love with decimals and libraries. One Sunday during chapel at Amherst, Eureka! He gets the idea of using numbers and decimals to organize library books. With a consistent numbering system, it would be easy to find exactly where a book was located, no matter which library you were visiting. Melville is fired up. He visits libraries all over the Northeast. He reads other people's ideas about organizing collections. Then he invents his own classification system. Melville assigns numbers to 10 broad classes of knowledge. History, 900s. Science, 500s. Arts, 700s. Then he divides classes into 10 divisions and each division into 10 sections with decimals to show specific subclasses. Numbers are written on spines of books. Books sit neatly in order on shelves. Totally efficient. The trustees at Columbia College in New York are impressed. They invite him to become their chief librarian. But they don't know what a zealot they've brought to their campus. Melville thinks big. In addition to working in the library, he wants to open a school at Columbia to train librarians. Librarians would educate readers and guide them to the highest quality books through best books lists. He thinks college-educated women would be terrific in this profession. They have clear heads, strong hands, and great hearts. Also, they will work for less money than men. No problem, right? Wrong. Columbia trustees do not want women on their campus, period. Only men. Do you understand this, Melville? But Melville ignores their roars. He figures once they see his school in action, they'll purr. He advertises for students. 20 sign up. 17 of them are women. He sets up a library school in a storeroom, above the chapel, across the street from the Columbia campus. Technically, it's not a classroom, he figures, so technically he's not breaking any rules. The students think Melville is energetic, awesome, and odd. Melville rushes into the classroom at the last minute, delivers a lecture at 180 words per minute, then rushes out. He invents ways to keep libraries quiet so patrons can read and study. Rubber tips on chairs and tables. Rubber wheels on book trucks. Slippers for library workers. He tells people to whisper at the loan desk and no talking at all everywhere else. He invents ways to be efficient. A pencil with one end blue, the other red. A narrow ruler at the low numbers wider at the higher numbers, a hanging vertical file. And Melville always writes in shorthand or a simplified spelling on recycled library catalog cards. Though, although, thorough, through, jumped, sounds. Why, he's even gotten rid of silent letters in his name so that Melville has become Melville. Melville is a whirlwind. He pushes, pushes, pushes his ideas on people. His brain can hardly keep up with all the ideas he has. He wants to see changes right away. This makes people angry. They tell him to sit still and be quiet. Shh! But do you think Melville sits still? No. He wants to do more and more and more. He becomes state librarian and secretary to the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York. He organizes the New York State Library Association. He provides books for the blind. He launches a traveling library system. He helps form the Children's Library Association. Phew! Boy, some people love Melville. Efficient 
hardworking, determined, visionary. Other people do not love Melville. Controlling, demanding, manipulative, glib-tongued. But whether people find him appealing or annoying, the one thing that they agree on is that Melville Dewey did make a difference in the world. He organized library collections, educated librarians, and championed free libraries for everyone. A pretty good legacy for a boy who organized his mother's cupboard and walked 10 miles to buy a dictionary, don't you think? And there's some information about Melville Dewey. It's always good to look in the back of a book for a synopsis of what his life was really all about. And here is a timeline that lists when he, when he was born all the way till when he died. So those are like important events in his life listed by year. And then it talks about some of his other reforms. And after reading his other reform passions, I think that he would have loved the shorthand that boys and girls use today to text each other. And there is information about the Dewey Decimal Classification System that he created and selected other sources that you could read more about Melville Dewey. And then picture credits, of course. And you will find this book in the 92s on the DEW shelf for Dewey. The end.